Let me start by acknowledging that today I'm joining you from my home in the Fraser Valley, which is situated on the unceded territories of the Kwantlen and Katsi First Nations. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that in this virtual space, we'll all be joining from various locations within and beyond BC. I invite you to take a moment as we start today's session to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat and reflect on the relationship and the partnerships with the traditional owners and keepers of these lands where we live, work and learn. Let me start with a few housekeeping arrangements just before I get to introduce today's keynote speaker. This event, as you heard, is being recorded and will be shared afterwards as a resource on the CTLT YouTube channel and also linked from the academicintegrity.ubc.ca website. The chat will be available. Please do feel free to communicate with your colleagues in the chat section. The event will have live, live closed captions. You can see them by clicking on the CC button in your meeting controls. We have staff available to assist with any technical difficulties you may have, and you can contact them via the chat. Uh, we would ask that you keep your microphone on mute during the presentation. Your webcam, as you choose, can be turned on or off. Uh, we will be taking questions during the um, lecture in the chat section. These questions will either be addressed in the chat or during the Q&A after the keynote presentation, where we'll have the opportunity for spoken questions and discussion. So now on to the topic of today's event. This week, Academic Integrity Week, is focused on highlighting some of the important questions around raising awareness about academic integrity and its ties to ongoing work on the topic across both of UBC's Vancouver and Okanagan campuses. And we are absolutely delighted to be welcoming Dr. Sarah Elaine Eaton to open Academic Integrity Week. As I'm sure many of you know, Dr. Eaton is an award-winning educator and researcher whose scholarship and work focuses on academic integrity in higher education. She's an associate professor at the University of Calgary, where she also serves as the university's inaugural educational leader in residence for academic integrity. She is the editor-in-chief of the International Journal for Ed Educational Integrity and the author of Plagiarism in Higher Education, Tackling Tough Topics in Academic Integrity. Her research can be found across many national and international journals. She's the co-founding member of the Alberta Council on Academic Integrity and co-chair of the Council's Contract Cheating Working Group. I could go on. Her list of accomplishments in scholarship around academic integrity is hugely impressive. Today, Dr. Eaton will be speaking to us about what academic integrity looks like through a teaching and learning lens and as an everyday practice for ethical decision-making in our teaching and learning activities. She's also going to touch on the topic of the contract cheating industry and what educators need to know to help students protect themselves as they focus on learning ethically. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eaton virtually to Academic Integrity Week and as she gives her keynote lecture. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Dr. Bates, and thanks so much for inviting me to join with you during Academic Integrity Week at the University of British Columbia. I'll just bring up my slides and we'll start from there. You should be able to see them now. The focus of today's talk is going to be academic integrity through a teaching and learning lens. So we won't be focusing very much on policies, procedures, or dealing with misconduct, though I wanted to acknowledge just straight off the bat that those are important aspects of academic integrity that have long been researched um, in, in the field, but the teaching and learning side of things a little bit less so. So this focus that we have now on teaching and learning is fairly new over the past 20 years or so, and it's an exciting time to be involved in this field. Also wanted to give you permission. Um, you'll see there that my Twitter handle is on my introductory slide. You certainly have permission to take screenshots of any of the slides from today's presentation. 
to share them on social media. I've also given the team at UBC permission to share the slide deck with you afterwards, uh, should you wish to have the entire slide deck. So just so that we've got that out of the way and that you understand I am okay with you sharing everything and anything from this presentation. Um, and I just wanted to add on to the land acknowledgement that Dr. Bates gave from the land that he was joining from today. I'm joining you from Treaty 7 territory, my home in Calgary, which is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And taking a little pause to frame this conversation around ethical decision making and the ethicality of the land acknowledgements that we've do. We've learned to do these land acknowledgements over the past several years in our institution as a way of opening our public events and even smaller events at our institution. And this is part of the grounding of our ethical practice as educators, scholars and administrators in higher education. So we do this not simply as a matter of rote or expectation, but as a matter of showing our respect to those who came before us in their stewardship and care of the lands that we now reside on. And this idea of stewardship can just um, go over into academic integrity as well, because I don't like to think about academic integrity in, in terms of a set of rules of thou shalt or thou shalt nots, but rather in terms of who are we as a learning community and how do we want to support our students with this work. So for me, ethics and integrity are inherently interconnected. As Dr. Bates mentioned, um, I sort of live and breathe academic integrity in this space. I've been working in higher education since 1994 and came to this work through, through education. But prior to that was situated with a humanities background studying languages and literature that led to an interest in plagiarism and later to educational policy. And then from there, looking at other questions related to ethics and higher education. So when I started out researching this field, it started out as plagiarism and academic integrity. And that was a little bit boring. As I went further into my research, I began looking into questions of corruption, fraud, contract cheating, admissions fraud, research misconduct among faculty, or misconduct among um, university administrators. So now I tell people that I study the dark underbelly of higher education, and that's much more interesting. And I can say that it's a broad field and we welcome researchers and scholars into the field because there's an awful lot to study uh, and to understand. But we're here today to talk about academic integrity. So let me start by inviting you to contribute actively to the text chat through the session, which I'll be looking at and I know others will as well. What do you think when you hear the term academic integrity, like what did you think today's talk was going to be about? What would you like it to be about? What were you hoping it's not going to be about? I'll just give you a moment to contribute through the text chat because I'd like to get a sense of uh, what you'd like to get uh, from today's session. Okay, I see there we've got contract cheating, honesty. These are great topics. We'll cover a little bit of both of those. Ethics, norms, and honesty, terrific. Not cheating in discipline, honoring someone else's work, honesty, acting in good faith helping, uh, oh wow, the chat is going so fast, I can barely keep up, this is great. Um, helping others maintain their academic integrity, conflict of interest, fabulous, okay. These are wonderful. We will touch on many of these topics today. As you can see, this is a broad field and there's an awful lot to uncover. I'm so pleased that you're having Academic Integrity Week across your campus. And hopefully this will be a launching point for future discussions and activities on your campus throughout the academic year and every academic year from beyond. So we will talk about contract cheating today. We'll talk a little bit about um, equity, diversity and integrity and the role that that plays. Uh, in this work, um, but sort of uh, grounding this work in our teaching and learning practice. I'm going to frame today's talk in terms of um, our experience through this semester. So we'll start by looking at um, how do we start our semester with integrity, recognizing, of course, that we're in the middle of our term now, but sort of framing this of what do we do before we get into the term to start uh, framing the conversation with our students and also with our colleagues and setting the foundations for integrity um, before we step into our classrooms at the beginning of term. And then looking at academic integrity through the semester, through teaching and learning practice. What does it look like? What does it mean? How do we support uh, ethical decision-making throughout the term? And then finally, ending the term with integrity. Um, and sometimes looking at the question of assessments, uh, as well as addressing breaches of integrity. Often we will identify those at the end of the term, though not always, 
but I needed a framing for the talk and this is it, sort of taking you through the journey of a semester with integrity. We've got question and answers. I've put it at the end of the agenda, but you're certainly welcome to uh, ask your questions in the text chat and we've got folks that will gather those up and we will uh, address them at the end of the session. And I really invite your questions and comments throughout because for me that helps to make the experience just as rich as I engage in some of this content. Some of you may be familiar with the International Centre for Academic Integrity. It was launched by uh, the late Don McCabe and colleagues in the United States in 1999 and has been going strong ever since. They started by repositioning academic misconduct and academic dishonesty into, instead as academic integrity, looking at framing it within a set of six fundamental values, courage, fairness, honesty, respect, responsibility, and trust. Using this as a point of departure for proactive and positive conversations to encourage ethical decision-making. This has been taken up in different ways around the world, but these fundamental values um, are, are core to the work that we do around integrity, not only for academics, but also for research and, and general ways of professional conduct in education. This is a useful point of departure for starting conversations, but I always like to start with a word of caution and that these um, values are not absolute. So sometimes when we see literature or documentation around these values, we see them framed in terms of uh, st only student conduct. So for example, uh, responsibility. A student has a responsibility to do honest work. A student has a responsibility to follow the instructions of the instructor. However, there can be nuances to some of these values that are worth considering and unpacking. And I'll use responsibility again as, as my example. Um, sometimes students may have responsibilities to social and peer groups in terms of helping or sharing uh, materials or answers. And this responsibility actually extends so far as in order for students to maintain their social standing within their peer group, they must engage in the sharing or helping behaviors. And if they don't, they risk losing social standing among their peers. And as you know, for uh, you know, the, the young people in particular, when I talk about young people or youth, I'm using the UNESCO definition of youth that extends to persons up to age 30, that maintaining social standing within a peer group uh, can be a strong motivator for behavioral decisions. Sometimes when I use this example of students having responsibility to share within a group, um, what I hear is um, a counter argument or a counter perspective around students from a particular country or a particular cu uh, culture as having a responsibility to their peers. That may be true, but it's not the whole story. There's ample research to show of a phenomenon called frat files. It's a pejorative term short for fraternity files, but it talks about a practice of sharing among Greek society members, fraternities and sororities that started and been known to exist in the United States since the early part of the 20th century. And students would be expected to have printed copies of tests, assignments, and other learning materials that they would literally add to files in boxes often stored in the basements of these houses that other members could access as a means of sharing. Of course, those files have moved online now and they're in Google folders and drives. The idea was that students would be helping their fellow members over time and that over time there would be a bank of tests or assignments. Now, in no way do I share this example to disparage Greek societies because I know that they also do an awful lot of good and provide support to their members. But I wanted to share this example to illustrate that the notion of sharing among student groups is not restricted to students from other countries or other cultures. And we need only look inward at our North American uh, history of higher education to see that sharing among students has not only been prevalent, but persistent over decades. Um, and it's not new, it didn't start with commercial file sharing, though commercialization of file sharing has certainly become more prevalent since the dawn of the internet. So when we talk about these values, it's important to keep them uh, sort of in context and avoid talking in terms of absolute um, morality, but rather as a point of departure for an informed conversation with students. When we engage in this sort of informed conversation, what we're doing is resisting traditional antagonistic models which puts students against professors in terms of talking about misconduct and reframes it in terms of a wraparound approach for students in which there are various stakeholder groups and students still have responsibilities, but so do we as educators and administrators 
uh, along with the support and professional staff in our institutions. And I've included community stakeholders here because uh, parents have a role to play, particularly with younger students or undergraduate students, as well as alumni, in engaging in broader conversations about ethics and integrity. So you can see here that this is a multi-stakeholder model in which different parties have different but complementary responsibilities for students. So what we're trying to do is challenge these notions of it's all about the students and their responsibilities, but rather look at what are all of our responsibilities in this equation without absolving students of their responsibilities as part of the process. Our language is important when we talk about academic integrity and academic misconduct. Uh, in some of the work that I do, I'll often hear people use the term academic integrity synonymously with academic misconduct. But let me be clear that academic integrity is about more than the absence of misconduct. Um, and when I hear colleagues saying, oh, I'm, deal I'm dealing with a case of academic integrity, I will gently correct them and say, I think you're dealing with a case of academic misconduct. Um, so we think, I think of academic integrity, this is a model that I've put together with some graduate students as being kind of a continuum where we can think about sort of, you know, if you think about an arrow going on the right hand side, this is the future direction where we want to encourage ethical decision making through education and skill building and communication of our expectations. But we know that there's, there can be a moment of a breach where we think something has happened or we know something has happened. And then that, that then can be uh, what we call a critical incident. Um, where we're identifying an allegation of misconduct, there might be an investigation process, uh, and that there are initial stages of addressing a case of actual or alleged misconduct. And if that's the case, then we're dealing with an integrity breach, which will trigger our policy and procedures uh, around academic misconduct in our institutions, right? It can involve your investigation, your case management, your hearing sanctions, and your appeal process. Um, but using the, the language that we use is important. So we don't want to um, confuse academic integrity with its breaches or with academic misconduct. Um, and so although we're, we want to use positive language, when we know there's been a breach, we treat it as such. Uh, and I also wanted to highlight the gray area on this continuum because this gray area can be a space of exceptional stress for students as well as faculty and staff when they're engaged in uh, the beginning of a case or when a case is brought forward or an allegation is brought forward. Um, and we don't have time today to sort of talk about all of the mental health impacts on academic integrity. And I would encourage you to consider this as a topic for future discussion, the impact both on students and on faculty members uh, when an allegation is brought forward. But this, continu this continuum is something that we see throughout the academic year. Um, and so we want to set the stage for academic integrity, but also be able to address it uh, when there are breaches of it. But let's go back to sort of thinking about setting the stage of academic integrity with our students and starting the semester with integrity. So let me ask you, how do you talk to your students about academic integrity? And I'll just give you a moment to offer some uh, thoughts in the chat box about how you um, talk to your own students about academic integrity. Terrific. I'm seeing some great responses here about asking students what they know, um, putting it in course syllabi, and that they need to know the material for their own advantage. Uh, and a first class meeting, I love this, a class discussion on values for this course, and then you develop that together, a co-created notion of integrity and ethics for the purposes of learning. Great. Um, and context with respect to the future professional code of ethics. And certainly for those who work in professional schools, connecting academic integrity in the classroom to professional conduct in, in um, the profession after graduation can be a really useful way of helping students make sense of this for sure. Uh, in the syllabus, you talk about it in your expectations, terrific, reminding students of resources available to them and trying to connect it to their lives beyond this course. These are all excellent. Uh, and some of you are saying you read articles and discuss. Uh, through scenarios um, and real life examples. So these are terrific um, and I appreciate all of them. So it sounds like you're well on your way in your community to building this ongoing um, community of academic integrity with your students. 
because today's session was focused around teaching and learning, I wanted to um, frame the talk around being proactive with students, demystifying um, the conversation around academic integrity and give you some concrete practical strategies that you can use as an educator in your own classroom. So here's the high level overview of five strategies that I'll talk about in turn in just a moment. And one is to be straightforward with students using humor, being a little vulnerable, showing compassion, and then showing them where help is available. So I'll go through each of these. Um, and I will say through the remainder of the presentation, I have a variety of links on the slides. Um, you, like I said, you're welcome to take screenshots of any of the slides. I have the links already ready for you um, in a separate Word document, and I will paste them into the chat so that you can then have them after the presentation as well. So don't worry about copying the links from the slides. I've got them ready for you. Uh, in terms of being straightforward, um, one of the key messages that I share with my own students is that I care about academic integrity. Well, in my case, of course I care because it's also my research area. Um, but I tell my students, I expect them to care about academic integrity. There's been lots of research done that shows that there is a connection between instructor attitudes uh, and rates of misconduct. And the more that faculty care about academic integrity, so do students. Um, and I tell my students, if you find yourself on the brink of making a decision that you might regret later, such as engaging with an essay mill or a contract cheating company, please reach out to me. Um, I tell them uh, that the contract cheating companies will have their chat, live chat, uh, text chat boxes that are available 24 seven, and I'm not available 24 seven because I'm a human being and I also need to sleep. But if they email me or reach out, I will make every attempt to contact them um, within a reasonable amount of time. So I set my parameters for my students from the beginning, letting them know, for example, I try and take the weekends off email, but if there's something urgent, then let me know. Um, and that uh, if they're not sure about something that they can ask me. I try and create a safe space for my students where I'm uh, their learning partner from the beginning. Um, but I also let them know that it's not all sunshine and roses, and that if there is a breach of academic integrity, that I'm responsible for reporting it. Um, so that this isn't a soft on crime approach, uh, that we will do everything we can to proactively address integrity and build ethical decision making through our courses. But if there's a breach, uh, then it's not my job to hide it or cover it up or pretend it didn't exist but that I would be reporting it. So that there is accountability from my students uh, with me and I let them know that I'm accountable to them. And I'm also accountable to the school that employs me. Um, so just setting those expectations up front with, with my students. Um, and in some of the research literature, and there's a whole list of references at the end of uh, the slide deck as well, uh, but I didn't want to bore you with too many of those in the presentation itself. But there is research to show that um, there is a referential relationship uh, when it comes to caring about students and it's referential rather than uh, reciprocal so when I it's not that I care about my students and my students care about me it's that when I care about my students my students care about learning which is ultimately why I'm here doing this job um, and so the more that I can show them that I'm here for them and I, I care about their learning experience then the more they themselves should care about it as well um, so we'll move into the next one because this can be kind of a heavy topic. So we can use humor with our students and there are actually a number of videos available. I'm going to play this one for you. It's just about two minutes uh, and I think you'll see some familiar faces that you'll like uh, and that this will be useful for you with your own students. Oh, this is perfect. Acceptable. Oh, this is perfect. Unacceptable! And that's everything. Great. Next up. Um, the same as she said. Acceptable! And that's everything. Great. Next up. Um. <laughs> Same as she said. Good 
Johnny boy. Hey, Freddy. Acceptable. Oh, looking good, Johnny. Hey. Freddy. Unacceptable. Um, I hope that you took a moment to notice that uh, during that just two minute presentation that they went over various forms of copying and plagiarizing, including text um, copying, uh, copying another's presentation, and then copying in a non-text based discipline such as art. Um, and I agree with the comment in the chat that says the University of Alberta has a long standing website uh, on academic integrity and a number of videos. This is just one example. And I should also uh, point out that this video was produced in 2013 before Kim's Convenience. So before Andrew Fung made it big as a CBC superstar, uh, he was doing videos on academic integrity, which uh, makes it all the more poignant today. So I'm hoping you can see and start to think about how you can use short little videos like this in your own classes with your own students and engage them in conversations about academic integrity um, at the beginning of class. So that was sort of the next strategy around being uh, being using humor uh, to facilitate these conversations that can sometimes um, be a little bit difficult. And I put in uh, here as well around being a little bit vulnerable and telling your own story. So sometimes uh, people think that when I uh, work in academic integrity, that I'm the, uh, you know, if you're of a certain generation that you might remember the church lady from Saturday Night Live. And I always like to tell people that is not me. Um, and I don't walk around wearing a halo. And I don't expect that anybody else walks around wearing a halo either. I see academic integrity from a developmental perspective. Um, and I will tell students that I remember plagiarizing um, in grade school. I still remember it to this day and copying out of an encyclopedia and thinking to myself that I couldn't have said it any better than what was in the encyclopedia. My teacher didn't catch me because um, uh, I was considered a good student, but I still remember doing that. Um, so that's a non-threatening uh, example or a story that I can share with my students and I can let them know that if they're, if they're struggling with something, that they're not alone, that others have these experiences and that it's, a mat it's not a matter of moral superiority but rather of learning development and skill building. Um, so I wanna create a, a situation with my students where I'm showing them my humanity and that I'm here to help them learn. Uh, and I'm not here to be a police officer. It's not why I got into this field uh, and that I want to support them with their learning. And I try and end on that positive note around letting them know I'm here to support them with their learning. Um, and I think it can help students a lot when we share our own vulnerability with them. And just this year, I was talking with some of our first year students and they were reminding me how nervous they were going into their classes for the first time with their professors and how intimidated they were meeting a professor for the first time. And so those of us who've been in this uh, game for a long time, we forget. We forget how intimidating it can be for students to meet professors for the first time um, and that showing them our humanity doesn't make us any less effective as educators. Uh, and in fact, it can create a better rapport with our students. Um, and then the next one is related to that and it's around showing compassion. And others in the academic integrity field have argued that those six values are in and of themselves um, deficient or could be challenged and that maybe um, other values such as compassion or dignity should be added uh, to the existing set of fundamental values and compassion uh, for sure is one that's widely talked about in the literature, not only in Canada, but also among colleagues in Latin America and beyond. Uh, I think we can show that compassion to our students through teaching and learning practices, such as um, offering formative assessment opportunities and giving students a way to fail and it being okay and that it's being safe. 
Um, I have a colleague at the University of Calgary, Dr. Meadow Schroeder, that I wanted to give a shout out here too, because she gives her students a get out of jail free card uh, in every course she teaches. And what she says to them is, your get out of jail free card gives you a week's extension on any assignment with no questions asked. All you have to do is email me and say, I want to use my get out of jail free card. You get one a term. Um, and this idea of giving students a little bit of relief that they can uh, they can dial back the pressure valve um, on, on their terms and we don't ask them questions about it. Um, and she said not very many of her students actually take them up on it, uh, on this get out of jail free card. But knowing that they have it in and of itself brings them a sense of relief and agency in their own learning. And ultimately, I think we want students to be agents of their own learning and putting dignity before deadlines. So I often will say to my students, I think I mentioned that if they're on the brink of making a bad decision, uh, then come and talk with me. Um, and certainly during COVID, I've, I've reframed this for students and said, if you are needing something to help you get through your learning experience, if I can extend the deadline, I will. I used to be one of the most militant people I know when it came to deadlines. And I was the person that would say, look, learning to meet deadlines is about learning to be an adult. When you get into your workplace, you're going to have all kinds of deadlines. Then I became an academic and started insistently asking for extensions on everything. <clears throat> So no, knowing that I do this as a professor, um, it made me think a little bit how I want to treat students the way I, I want it to be treated. Um, and that, again, sort of telling students that we care. And this doesn't make us, again, any less effective as educators when we communicate that. And then finally, um, showing students where they can get help. Um, and I've used the term show here quite deliberately rather than tell, um, because thinking about um, how you can, how can students uh, find out about resources on your campus? And you can do this through your own educational activities, such as an in-class or a web quest activity, a treasure hunt to find academic integrity resources on campus for students. And sometimes, I don't know what it's like on your campus, but on our campus, there are so many resources for students that are in different places. So we have a student success center where students can go for workshops and writing support and other forms of support through the Office of Student Experience. Then the library also has workshops on citing, referencing, using reference management software, and so on. And then there's additional resources through our teaching and learning center. So there's literally resources all over our campus, physically and virtually, for students to access. But sometimes they don't know that they exist. So I'll often say it's not enough for resources to exist, but students have to recognize how to access them and that they're there for them when students need resources. Um, and as well, you can have students create videos, posters, etc., cetera, um, and have a little contest where they're showing their peers how to access um, resources around academic integrity on, uh, on their own campus. And the more I do this work, I have to say that the more I think engaging students as partners in academic integrity is a critical piece of the equation that we often miss in Canada. When I hear my colleagues speak in Europe in particular, uh, in the UK, um, that they're making great strides over there with entire students as programs, um, students as partner programs set up around academic integrity. Um, so this is something that I think we can uh, do a little bit better with in Canada broadly. And then finally, just even setting up tables or resources uh, for students um, to promote academic integrity it can be a very simple, low cost, low resource way to help get the idea out there. We've combined this with um, a prize wheel, for example, where students can offer, answer a question about academic integrity and then win a little piece of swag. Uh, and it's to generate conversations with students about this. So there is lots of things we can do to engage our students uh, and then helping them engage with one another as well, I think is a key, a key piece of this and showing them where to get help. So let's kind of think about um, moving from uh, helping students into our instructional um, integrity and I use instructional integrity as a part of academic integrity knowing that academic integrity is about more than student, uh, student conduct. So let me ask you, what are your key recommendations to support instructional integrity. And if we're talking about promoting integrity with peers, with students as peers, then we as educational peers and academic peers can do the same thing. So let me just give you a moment to think about uh, what would you recommend say to a brand new teacher who's just starting, a postdoctoral fellow, or even an experienced peer who may never have talked about this in their classes before. 
Oh, terrific. Thank you. Uh, we've got a recommendation here about walking the talk uh, and referencing sources on slides. Yes, thank you for that as well. Yeah. In my case, I've put some of the references at the end of my slides, but I have a, a works consulted or a references list there uh, as well. Uh, one of the things we even talk about is uh, referencing images when we have them. Um, and then uh, you may have noticed that um, I've done that on a couple of my slides. I've said that the image will come from color box or something like that um, and giving space and time for the discussion. That's very important as well because students themselves may feel uncomfortable talking about this topic and not assuming the students know or understand. These are amazing suggestions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and really appreciate the insight that it's not one and done. It's not that we talk about it once and then expect students to understand. And we know that even for ourselves as academics, right, we have to practice citing and referencing. And when our citing manuals are updated, uh, that it's a whole new learning game for us, right? When I don't know if many of you are using APAs in your field of, or your discipline, but when they updated to seven, I was like, okay, here we go again. I started with five as a graduate student after having come over from humanities where we used MLA, went through five, went through six into seven. And every time it's a new learning and new practice. Um, so it's a developmental thing. Um, and model giving credit, even when we're sharing stories or points of view that come from someone else. This is a fantastic suggestion uh, as well. Uh, and talking about that uh, others through our, um, our lectures and our oral traditions as well. And speaking of uh, giving credit to others um, when we're talking about them, this is a quotation from a friend and colleague, Dr. Julia Christensen Hughes. Um, and she did a study back in, was published back in 2006 with the man who co-founded the International Center for Academic Integrity, Don McCabe. And they did what's still the largest study on academic misconduct in Canada. Um, and, uh, and from that work, um, which was published in the Canadian Journal of Higher Education, she coined this phrase, and that's that students cheat when they feel cheated. Um, and she talks about, uh, they, they mined some of their data and responses from students and like, when do students feel cheated? And students feel cheated when instructors aren't putting the time and effort into their courses. One example that came through their research was when instructors obviously recycle their own assessments year after year after year, students can tell. And they say to themselves, well, if they don't care enough to give us new assignments, they're cheating us uh, by not updating and refreshing their assessments. So why shouldn't we go and find the answers to these old um, assessments? I think from the perspective of a student, it's a valid question. So what are the things that we are doing as educators in terms of our own ethical practices around assessments so that we're letting our students know that we're, we're providing them with fresh content and fresh material. Um, because we know now that within moments of an assignment being posted, the material is available online through commercial file sharing sites. So the idea of uh, old assignments being stored in paper file boxes is old news, uh, that it's all done now through peer file, file sharing either at a local level, say through a Google Doc or a Google folder, or through a commercial file sharing enterprise. Uh, and this sort of leads us into the discussion around contract cheating. Um, this term is still fairly new in many Canadian circles, um, and that we may know the term essay mill or term paper mill, which has been around since the 1970s. That industry uh, started uh, in the Eastern seaboard of the United States with um, physical storefronts and then made its way up to Toronto and then west in both the US and in Canada. And then very quickly uh, by the 1980s, there were storefronts uh, just about in every country across the world. Some jurisdictions still have physical storefronts where academic work can be bought and sold, but by and large, it moved on, online in the 1990s with the commercialization of the internet. Uh, about 15 years ago, um, two computer scientists found their students outsourcing their coding assignments to an outfit called rent -a coder in the UK. And they sort of grappled with this and said, well, the term essay mail or term paper mail doesn't work for them because they're computer scientists. So they came up with a term that would apply to both text-based and non-text-based disciplines. Um, and we know that this is when a third party is basically completing the work on behalf of a student such that we don't know who completed the work in the end. 
Um, we know that there can be parents or partners who can do this on behalf of students, but this has sort of become less of a focus than the commercial enterprises that have made this a global industry that we've now found uh, we can estimate is worth about $15 billion US. And when you think about the annual operating budget of your university, um, uh, for us at the University of Calgary, the global contract cheating industry could fund our university to operate for about 10 years. Um, and we know that the industry is growing and that it's predatory. Um, and before the pandemic, we would ask ourselves, okay, well, how often is this actually happening? Um, and Guy Curtis and Joe Clare over in Australia, they did a meta-analysis of existing studies with self-reported data. Um, they came up with an average of about 3.5% of students. Guy Curtis has just released a new paper during the pandemic, and they now estimate that that 3.5% um, that average was inaccurate. Uh, and they estimated to be four times that amount now during the pandemic. What they did find uh, of particular interest was that uh, of about two thirds of the students who engage with an SAML, they will do it more than once. But all of these numbers were pre-pandemic. And if your campus is anything like ours, the rates of commercial file sharing and contract cheating have increased exponentially. We don't have those numbers on our campuses yet, one of the policy things that I'm advocating is that we actually name contract cheating in our policy documents. Right now, we don't. We only name um, sort of the traditional things, plagiarism, collusion, exam cheating, et cetera. And contract cheating has not yet factored into our policy documents. And we only track the behaviors that are named in policy. So we don't yet have the mechanisms to track this behavior. Um, I'm hoping that we'll get there. I'm hoping that all Canadian universities will, will get there and have, have done a policy analysis of um, 80 post-secondary uh, institutions so far in Canada and have identified that only Ryerson University and McEwen University have named contract cheating in their policies. Interestingly, those are two teaching focused universities. To the best of my knowledge, none of the U15 have gotten there yet. Um, so we think, okay, 3.5% of students, what does this mean for us in Canada? Again, a pre-pandemic estimate. I took Curtis and Claire's 3.5% average and mapped it to SATSCAN data for post-secondary enrollments in Canada. Um, and we're looking at about a total enrollment of 2.1 million students. So we can reasonably estimate that uh, before the pandemic, about 75,000 students across Canada were engaging in contract cheating. And if we take Curtis and Claire, or Curtis um, at all's new estimate during the pandemic and multiply that by about four, we can see that this problem has increased uh, quite a bit during COVID-19. Um, now, in, in case you're at the point where you're getting angry about students and your blood is starting to boil, let's look at this from a different perspective. We know that during COVID-19, the kind of marketing that contract cheating companies will engage in has become aggressive and customized to COVID-19. And we see messages of help and support and convenience being very common in the marketing rhetoric that these companies will engage in. So on the left side of your screen is a contract cheating advertisement. Some examples there with a language such as stay safe at home, COVID-19, we're working as usual to get your papers done 24 seven um, and saying at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it, but it says our services are not interrupted by the coronavirus outbreak. Feel free to order your papers as usual. So are there are these messages being conveyed to students that these companies are there for them 24 seven, and they will uh, exacerbate antagonistic relationships that may have existed or may have been perceived to exist between students and their schools, saying your school is open 8.30 to 4.30, Monday to Friday, but we're here for you 24 seven, seven days a week. These companies will um, try and increase a rift and put a rift between students and uh, their schools. And I put on the right hand side there a, uh, an image of a flyer. So it's pretty common at Canadian campuses that you would walk into a lecture hall and find flyers from these homework completion services that then we would then gather up uh, and then put in the trash cans. Um, and then during the pandemic, these flyers went into our communities beyond our campus into a community. This is one that was near the University of Calgary. And you can see that all the phone number tabs were, were uh, ripped off the bottom. So um, that we know that these are predatory. And it, um, just a side note here, if you happen to have a statement on free speech, 
on your campus. Um, a couple of years ago, the Alberta government mandated that all post-secondary institutions in Alberta developed a statement on free speech based on the Chicago principles from the United States. And if you have something like that on your campus, you may have uh, your own get out of jail free card because often there's a little clause on there that communications are permitted on a university campus providing they do not interfere with the normal functioning of the university. And we have determined that contract cheating flyers interfere with the normal business of the university and therefore we can rip them down and throw them away without the risk of being censored or have legal action brought against us. So I'd encourage you to look at your own internal uh, processes around that because you may have something that you can already use on your own campus to get those flyers um, out of our classrooms. And speaking of contract cheating, uh, if your blood again has been boiling around uh, students engaging this, if you weren't convinced um, by the rhetoric and the marketing that these companies use to lure students in, please be convinced by the Better Business Bureau scam alert that was issued in 2021, a couple of months ago, about extortion that um, they're engaging in with students. And here's how it works. The students, when they engage with the company, will upload their assignment instructions to the company. They'll also give the company their credit card number to complete the assignment on their behalf. At that moment, the student, the company has the student's name. They know where they're going to school. They know what course they're taking. They know what assignment they will have completed for the student, and they have their credit card number. And they say to the student, we will continue to charge a credit card number. And if you cancel your credit card number or you cancel your credit card, we will report you to your school for cheating. And we will give them all of the information and provide all of the information to them uh, around this and you'll be expelled. So they're using these tactics to blackmail students. Uh, and this has now been documented in not only by the Better Business Bureau, but by scholars in this space and that students are largely unaware of these risks. And even if they don't get um, engaged in a, in a blackmailing scam, the psychological harassment from these companies, uh, texting them incessantly or emailing them, of when can we complete your next assignment? What do you need help with? What can we do for you? Um, has become a fairly common form of bullying for students. So you see that students are caught in this horrible place uh, where they know that they themselves have done wrong, and yet they also become the victim of this large global billion dollar industry. Um, and some colleagues in Alberta have dug into this a little bit and are starting to look at the parallels between the contract cheating industry and organized crime, which is a useful parallel because we know in both cases, a single individual cannot uh, address contract cheating by themselves. Um, and we know that the use of um, violence, coercion, bullying, harassment is fairly common, uh, and that there's also emerging evidence of these, these companies using legitimate or pseudo-legitimate services, such as tutoring, uh, in order to um, cover up their contract cheating services. So they might say, oh, well, we can have students, um, we can have someone provide tutoring services to you, and that tutoring might end up um, going over the line into things like providing real-time assistance during online exams, et cetera. Um, so we know that there is a, a much darker side to this than just students um, buying assignments online, that the industry itself is predatory. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we think it's so important to engage in these conversations with our students around this. I mentioned our national policy analysis that we've been doing uh, with teams across Canada, uh, where we've looked at the academic integrity policies or academic misconduct policies. They are named both ways across Canada, um, looking at uh, universities and colleges where English is the primary language of instruction. We've looked at 80 of them now. We've only found two universities and one college in Ontario that actually names the problem. I say we can't begin to address a problem that we do not name. So this is one of the reasons why Canada is falling behind other countries, such as Australia, uh, New Zealand, and uh, the UK and Ireland, where now in all four of those countries, it is illegal for companies to offer academic cheating services. Uh, and just in Australia, just this month, they've now initiated their um, first prosecution of a contract cheating uh, industry or a, a company and 51 internet service providers were told that they had to block access to a particular contract cheating website. So this is a landmark case in Australia and others of us uh, around the world who study this and pay attention to it um, are looking very closely. I actually find this 
simultaneously inspirational and terrifying because while I'm excited about what my colleagues are doing overseas, knowing that we're at the place in Canada where we're not even naming this in our institutional policy documents, we are likely years away from legislation, makes me worried. Uh, and one of my worries is that when contract cheating becomes difficult in other countries due to legislation and legal action, Canada becomes an even more attractive market for these predatory companies. Uh, and so this is why um, I emphasize again, the wraparound approach for students that is needed, where um, students, staff, administrators, faculty, and community stakeholders all have responsibilities. And I would even include here, when I talk about administration, I'm not only talking about the administrators who deal with misconduct cases, but also those who are responsible for putting forward policy decisions at the institutional level, because there are things that we need to do at every level, our classrooms, our institutions, uh, and even our society in terms of legislation and beyond to ensure that our students are supported with this work. Um, so this is why academic integrity is a shared responsibility um, and that it's no longer just us against the students. It's us and everyone on our campuses against the contract cheating industry. So let's kind of take this back, though, to teaching and learning for a moment. And let me ask you, um, what are some of the things that you would recommend in terms of ethical assessment um, for your students in terms of the classes that you teach? And I have some resources that I'll share with you in a few slides, but I'd like to ask you, um, what do you do in terms of assessment? And I'll uh, pause here and share the thought that's often shared by a colleague in Australia, Dr. Kath Ellis, and she says, we can't design out cheating, but we sure as hell can design it in. Um, and so things like multiple choice timed questions where, you know, the questions can be available online in a few moments after they're posted. Um, so that might not work, but what are some things that you think would work in terms of ethical assessment? Okay, I've got one here about um, practices of peer reviewing among students, increases their sense of honor towards their work and in each other's eyes. I love this. Open book and collaborative, absolutely. Providing students with meaningful choices emphasizes the students as partners approach and students being agents of their own learning. Um, doing scaffolded assessments in small steps um, and, and so forth. Uh, and you're right, it's not, it, we know that all kinds of assessments can be contracted out with very few exceptions. Those are typically performance. Um, types of assignments where students, again, are probably in a small class, uh, music, uh, art, et cetera, or in uh, demo type assessments where students have to do something um, in order to demo their assessment and having students write reflections on their work or learning. The, it's interesting because um, when we had Dr. Tracy Bertag here to speak to us in 2019, and she mentioned that uh, student reflections are one of the types of assignments that are outsourced. Um, but maybe having students do things in class as well. Uh, and so, yes, I agree here that the, in terms of finding a balance between designing out misconduct, which we know is difficult to do, and the practicality of limited resources, yes. And I wanted to share with you, I was in the um, Australian Academic Integrity Network conference that they held um, just, well, for me, it was last evening that I was tuning in. And colleagues in Australia have done some studies there, and they're starting to talk about the ways in which institutions create the conditions in which contract cheating can happen. It was a very interesting and fascinating discussion that we haven't quite got to yet in Canada, um, but thinking about things like class size and its impact on academic integrity um, and the use of key performance metrics that they're quite big on in Australia and how they feel that that is actually um, enabling the contract cheating industry. So a couple of things that we have, I have here for you are some resources that we have used at the University of Calgary, such as alternative assessment strategies for large classes. Uh, and I will put these in the chat for you because we know that large classes in particular can be problematic in terms of designing assessments that are meaningful, but can also be scaled up in a reasonable amount of time. And I will say for large classes, of course, having um, sufficient supports in terms of teaching assistance is sort of a key to upholding integrity for those. Uh, another resource that I have for you here is we have uh, the five key principles of meaningful um, assessment. And I can just quickly tell you that that is a focus on learning and a balancing of structure of the assignment with flexibility and providing clear instructions 
um, and when possible, uh, replacing timed exams with other kinds of assessments. And then number five being, of course, emphasizing academic integrity. So these are some sort of takeaways for you to have after the session that you might want to consider uh, with one of them here, the final one being the alternative online assessment. So including considerations for other types of um, assessments such as podcasts, oral exams, um, infographics, and so on. So these are some things for you to con consider as you're building your own um, culture of integrity uh, at UBC. So again, kind of coming back to this idea of the academic integrity continuum, we can start to think about what are the things we can do um, in our teaching practice. And then there's this moment of a breach. And we know that that's when we're entering into a different phase of this continuum. And what do we do then? Well, I'm guessing that you have your own policies and procedures um, at UBC about what you do then. And just kind of wanted to dwell on one aspect of reporting that doesn't get talked about a lot, but I think is worth considering. Um, and it's our, our ethical conduct uh, in terms of taking action when where there's an alleged or actual breach of integrity and thinking about equity, diversity, and inclusion as part of that practice. We're, we don't have very much data on this in Canada. We have a little bit of data um, from other countries about who gets reported um, and how it's dealt with. What we are finding is that there is an overrepresentation of particular student demographics in academic misconduct reporting. So some of you may have been familiar during the COVID-19 crisis about calls to action for race-based data collection for the purposes of um, addressing health concerns in particular populations. The idea of collecting um, demographic-based or race-based data needs to be underpinned by the idea of doing good rather than laying blame on particular groups. We know that international and domestic students actually cheat at about the same rates. That's what the research shows. Um, it also shows that domestic students are a bit better at hiding it. Um, and we know that uh, based on research out of the United States that international students are five times more likely to get reported for academic misconduct. So notice the difference there between who gets reported and who actually engages in the behavior. Research has shown that we have about the same rates of cheating uh, among our groups of students, but that our international students are identified more often and um, sometimes punished more harshly. And we know that, uh, that there's very little um, research, I don't, I don't know of any research yet, that looks at um, rates of misconduct among students of various genders, um, but we do know that men often get reported more than any other gender when it comes to misconduct, both academic and non-academic, but that uh, um, women are more likely to be forgiven. I didn't put that on the slide here, but there's one group in particular that is most likely than any other group to be forgiven without ever being reported for academic misconduct. And I'd like you to go back to grade three, me. And it's white women who are native English speakers. I call it the angel effect. Uh, we are most likely to be given a warning or to have our teachers simply overlook our behavior, uh, whereas students of color for whom English is an additional language are most likely to be identified and then, and then uh, punished harshly. And there is uh, research out of the UK as well that's showing that once international students have been identified for an incidence of misconduct, they are more likely to leave school than their domestic counterparts uh, and drop out um, or be expelled or suspended for their actions. So these are really deep questions around equity, diversity, and inclusion that we won't have time to go in today, but I'd like to kind of provide you with a starting point to have deeper conversations on your own campus about who gets reported, how are you tracking it, um, and how are you tracking it for the purposes of um, promoting equity on your campus. These are things even on our own campus that we haven't started to tackle yet. Um, they're big questions, and I will say, quite frankly, that there's reluctance um, around the kind of data that we would track because there is concerns that it could be misused. Um, so we're, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. However, we have made um, some strides at the University of Calgary in terms of our policies and procedures, and that we're using a balance of probabilities model for addressing issues of misconduct. There was a time when we needed to have proof for everything, and it was based on a model of criminal law. 
rather than on a balance of probabilities model. We've shifted that now. Um, and now we also have that every faculty has standard operating practices uh, because we know that reporting can look a little bit different, for example, in the Faculty of Arts than it might say in the Faculty of Nursing or Medicine or um, so we have these different uh, diff different somewhat standardized practices, but we make uh, provisions for same as conduct and field experience to be reported in some faculties. Um, and that we uh, ask our, you know, our staff to contact their associate head or their dean for details because we have them. And what we're trying to avoid are idiosyncratic responses where in one class a student might be facing a professor who wants to have a hug and it's all okay and another who wants to take no prisoners. Um, so we want fairly standardized practices around this. Um, and we also want our faculty to report the misconduct when it happens uh, so that we can begin to um, track and uh, so that if something's happened in the Faculty of Arts uh, and then there's another incident in the Faculty of Engineering through an option course, for example, we want to know about that. So we want to build a culture where faculty feel that they can address this in their classes and also um, when there's a breach that they, they can report it. We've heard things like, well, we're a research intensive university. I can spend you know, three hours documenting a case of misconduct or I can spend three hours working on a manuscript. What's gonna get me further in my career? Um, so when we started to hear things like that, we took it seriously. And now I'm actually really proud of this work we've done at the University of Calgary. We actually have academic integrity formally recognized in our staff process handbook. This is like brand new, it was just approved in June. Our general faculties council, which I think for you would be your Senate, um, has approved this handbook about what counts as teaching, research, and service. Uh, and now academic integrity is officially recognized as a teaching activity on our campus. So if people are uh, developing activities for academic integrity and they're documenting it, it can go in their teaching dossiers, they can put it in their annual reports about what they're doing to uphold academic integrity, and it is recognized in your annual performance reporting now. Like I said, brand new, hot off the presses, and I'm really stinking proud of this um, because it gives us a way to recognize this work and value it as well with service um, and that activities that relate to upholding academic integrity and research integrity as well are also considered an important part of service contributions to the university. Um, and this is for our academic staff, not just administrators. And so this helps to reinforce that this is everyone's responsibility. And we have ways to finally recognize this now as valuable academic work or academic labor. Um, and so these are things for you to think about at your institutional level. And how will you recognize this? If we want academic integrity to be part of teaching and learning, it needs to be recognized as part of teaching and learning through our teaching dossiers and our annual reports. So my last slide here um, is, that, is to think about developing your own culture of integrity, your microcultures in your own classes, um, that you can demonstrate integrity through your teaching. We want to also make sure that this isn't all just kumbaya, that when there are violations, we will report them. We have mechanisms to report them. And we also have expectations for academic staff to report them. Um, and that whether you, if you're doing this work, even if you don't have the formal mechanisms yet, Start to document your efforts and tell your own story of ethics and integrity through your teaching practice so you can help to build that sustained culture at an institutional and departmental level over time. So I've been talking for a long time. I'm going to stop sharing my slides and we can engage a little bit in some conversation. Thank you, Sarah. Let me um, just say, um, and I'm sure I speak for many people, um, insightful. Um, inspiring and also sobering as well. I think some of the data, particularly around the, the extent of the contract cheating industry and the predatory nature uh, really stuck a, struck a chord for many people about how it, you know, you said it, it places our students in that impossible situation, particularly if they reach out to these organizations for legitimate services in the first place, like, like tutoring. So um, lots for us to, to think about. We do have um, 20 minutes for questions. Um, I'm gonna kick off with one that came in in the chat uh, about 40 minutes ago. And it, it's on behalf of Joshua. He's, he, he was asking how, how vulnerable should one be when talking about academic integrity? 
Um, it's a good question, right? I think because, it, you know, you want to find that balance between where you feel comfortable talking uh, to your own students. I mean, I can share that example from me back in back in grade three. Um, I, I can also share examples of when my work has been plagiarized as an academic and how crummy it felt. Uh, and I think so many of us as academics have had that experience. Um, and it can happen in different ways. And this is part of what shapes our work. Um, and we've all seen unethical practices in, um, in higher education, whether it's us as students uh, doing something or having some, being on the receiving end of someone plagiarizing our own work. Um, and I think the more we can demystify it for students and make it something that we can talk about, the more easily they're gonna be able to talk about it and also come to us when they have questions. So it's a bit of a personal preference. I, I want to admit that. Um, and I say the more I do this work, the easier it becomes for me to talk about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I would invite questions from others. Just um, raise your virtual hand uh, and uh, I'll invite you to pose your, uh, your question to, uh, to Sarah. Um, while, while people are ruminating, um, maybe I'll jump in with one. Um, I wanted to say I found your description of how you had articulated um, ac upholding academic integrity and in your definitions of teaching, your definitions of service to be really, really impressive. I wonder if you could say something about the process that you took to actually, I can imagine it was a long and winding road. Um to some extent, yes. So we had these really old, outdated, um, I think they were called the um, APT manual, the I don't know, promotion and tenure, academic promotion and tenure manual. And they've been around since the 90s. And there was a committee struck to, um, to revamp them for the entire campus. I think it was a two or three year process. And it happened that they were asking, as, as these committees do, for input um, into what should go into it. And I had an opportunity to talk with the folks who were doing this work and said, look, academic integrity needs to be recognized. Um, in it and we went back and forth through a few iterations and I think that they consulted some folks in the executive leadership team we had the support of our provost and our vice provost of teaching and learning and um, ultimately folks folks agreed right so there's no it's not prescriptive in the handbook it's pretty it's pretty broad um, but the idea that it can be finally recognized so that when folks would come to us and say things like well I can spend some time reporting misconduct or I can spend it on a research manuscript what's going to get me further ahead that there had to be um, you know some way to recognize the work and effort that goes into this. And also we found as we were building our culture of integrity in our own campus, folks were putting an awful lot of time into developing activities to do in their classes. Um, and so we have some mechanisms, I think every university does for, you know, documenting when you're refreshing your course or creating a new course or new activities. And we're like, we need to build this in. And if folks are going to spend time and invest time in having proactive approaches to talking about activities or talking about integrity through activities, document it and share it uh, in, in their classes. So um, I think I kind of came in at the tail end of the development of this handbook. Uh, but once folks heard about it, uh, I think it was pretty easy to get them on board and have it recognized because uh, everybody that I talked to along the journey had a recollection of a time when they themselves had either documented a case of misconduct and it wasn't recognized as a service. Um, and then in some cases are thinking, oh yeah, if people do want to do this in teaching and practice, it could go into the teaching dossier. So I think even the people who were working on the handbook, when they reflected on their own experience in higher ed, it became obvious that they would have benefited if there had been a mechanism for it to be recognized. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a great example of just being in the right place at the right time. And uh... And, and a great result. Um, we have some questions coming in in the chat, but Laurie, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Thanks, Simon. And uh, Sarah, thank you, uh, as always, for uh, such an excellent talk. So rich. Um, I know a lot of us were um, eye opened um, about the contract cheating um, and the, the kind of um, dark underbelly, as you put it. Um, I like to share this kind of information with my students, and I think it's important that they know, but it's, um, I could imagine it being quickly veering off into a kind of scared straight model of um, these are the harms that will, you know, just say no kind of thing. I'm wondering if you have advice for us about how to provide what is really urgently important information in ways that um, will be heard. 
Like what's the just in time information that would open that conversation rather than overwhelming them? Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question, Lori. Um, and it might depend a little bit on your class and the size of the class and the rapport that you have with them. But I, I try and position myself as their, um, their ally and their learning partner and that letting them know that, you know, these companies are out there and they're, um, they are predatory, and, uh, but that they have a safe place where they can come and, uh, and ask. And I have a resource that I can try and find. Um, and I think it's from the University of New South Wales around what happens if uh, you think you've been caught contract cheating um, and to let students know that they can uh, they can come and talk to us. And that even if they have engaged with a contract cheating company, the repercussions of addressing that might be much less than... Um, than trying to deal with it on their own. And if something has gone wrong, that uh, we are we are here for them. I've just found the resource and I'm gonna pop it into the chat. It's an interesting, useful little flow chart that uh, can be a great talking point with students uh, about what, what do you do if this has happened? And basically you're not alone and we're here to help you. Yeah, there might be a consequence, but we're still here to help you. Yeah, thank you. Um... One, one from the chat, Joanne, I'm going to read out your question, but I would say um, feel free to put your hands up and, and read out your own question. That's that's OK, too. Um, Joanne says, uh, asks about the legislation around contract cheating. You, you mentioned a number of jurisdictions that have this and the, the landmark case in Australia. Um, your sense was it's a long way off in Canada. Could you expand on what steps you think might be think can or might be taking at this time? I, I guess that's what should we be doing and what what might happen in the future? Um, yes, I, I can actually I've been working with a research assistant here at the University of Calgary to put together a brief on some of the, the legislative options that might be uh, open to us. Uh, and I can send that information um, on to um, Ainsley and Jacqueline to share at UBC because we'll be doing our own webinar on that at the end of the month. Uh, and in doing that work, have consulted with folks in Australia and the UK and Ireland around what did it take for them to get their legislation. Interestingly, in those countries, the quality assurance body for higher education is national, right? So they've got TEXA in Australia, the QAA and the Office of Students in the UK, and they've got um, Quality and Qualifications Ireland there, and they were able to do it with through partnering with their quality assurance bodies. Um, and the folks, when we met with the folks at the QQI in Ireland, they told us it was about a seven year journey for them to get to the point of legislation. Um, and then one of the things that they'd done in the UK was they had um, their, their, Q, their quality assurance body work with the institutional provosts. And the provost got together and the provost wrote their own collective letter to the Minister of Higher Education with the support of the QAA um, to get the legislation forward. So you can see sort of how these different stakeholder groups, you've got the, the provosts and presidents working with the quality assurance body, working with the elected officials, all um, singing the same song and working together um, to make it happen over, over time. And I think one of the key bodies that we're not engaging in Canada that we should be engaging are the quality assurance bodies um, and talking to them, even uh, conversations around what can they do to build academic integrity into their own QA documents. So we're a little ways off, but I think we'll get there. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question in the chat, Joshua was asking about the, um, you mentioned the inequality gap between students who get reported uh, and those who are not, how can that be reduced? And he says, what should a more targeted individual such as himself do when they hear about situations like these? Um, we, yeah, it's, uh, it's really useful, I think, even to just start the conversations, right? And um, contemplate who, who are we identifying for misconduct and who are we forgiving? Um, and we, there's lots of research to show that sometimes faculty won't report. Um, incidences of misconduct. So even though in an ideal world, we're getting everything reported and uh, it's all getting processed, even if it's just um, to have it noted on a file, even if there's not a sanction applied, um, and looking at our own practices and reflecting back. And I look, I think on my own teaching practice of who have I reported for academic misconduct and under what circumstances have I reported them? Um, and I can think back and think, yeah, there have been some um, Canadian born native English speakers and there have been some who have not been. And sometimes this notion of 
the, uh, the Canadian born students might just be better at hiding it because they know how to work the system is something to pay attention to. So in our online classes and even in our face-to-face -face classes, right? Students not showing up, not being engaged. Those can be some of the telltale signs. Um, and we, we know that things like implicit bias training is contested and imperfect, but even starting the conversations on our campus around this, um, I think can lead to very useful actions um, that need to be undertaken at the local level, but supported by the administration. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Uh, Ainsley, go ahead. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for that fantastic talk. I, I would echo what Simon says. It was incredibly inspiring and really comes at a good time for us on this campus when, and both campuses when so much work is, is underway around academic integrity. I also wanted to point out that that concept of the wraparound approach and really making clear the roles of, of all different stakeholders, including administrators, speaking for myself, is incredibly inspiring. I wanted to go back to something you said early in the talk where you talked about the values associated with academic integrity. And that's something that a lot of institutions do to define it. And you raised a point about potentially including values like compassion and dignity into how we typically define integrity. I'm wondering if you know of institutions that have done this or if this is just a path that you think should be explored. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and I'm reflecting on a book. It's on the bookshelf behind me that you can't see because I have a Zoom background, but it's on uh, building a, a research agenda for academic integrity. And it's the last book that Tracy Bertag edited before she died. And in there, there's a chapter by a group of Latin American colleagues, and they called for compassion to be considered um, as an, uh, a value for academic integrity. Um, and looking at uh, really reducing the antagonistic relationships and uh, moral binaries and ethical binaries that can be set up, uh, you know, having students as being dishonest versus honest. Um, and that for them was, was rooted in some of their cultural traditions. So this idea of including compassion is one I have to give props to um, a group from Latin America for bringing that one forward, making me think deeply about compassion as a value that we might think about including as a, a foundation of academic integrity. So yeah, it's, it's uh, Jean Guerrero Deeb and his colleagues in Latin America. Thank you. Uh, Karen, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sarah, um, for that great talk. This is the second time I've seen you now, and it's been great both times. So I really appreciate your attendance here at UBC. I um, One of the questions I have for instructors is that I think there are still barriers in convincing instructors to spend time in class to talk more deeply and fulsome about academic integrity, because there's always that balance between getting through material, getting through the content, and, and doing things like this. And I'm just wondering, uh, well, one, if you have any comments about that, but also, are there any studies as well that show that, um, you know, spending time in the classroom and talking about this uh, with your students um, is time worth spent sort of in the long run, like sort of initial, you know, initial input is a, a really good payoff at the end. Yeah, uh, I love this question. Um, what, what I don't know of are cause and effect studies, right? I don't know that, you know, if we spend time talking about this at the beginning, will this reduce misconduct? Um, and uh, I think there's very few studies like that around academic integrity generally, but it's more of this idea of contribution uh, versus, you know, versus attribution, that, that kind of idea of if we do these things and what are the um, activities that can contribute to building a culture of integrity with, with our students. So, um, I, I, yeah, I think in terms of looking for cause and effect, we, we won't find it um, because, it, you know, it's this inherently complex, wicked problem on our campuses. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, dealing with other wicked problems at the societal level. I think academic misconduct is one that we deal with in higher education. Uh, and so what are the ways that we can uh, mitigate misconduct, build a culture of integrity? And there's so many different facets to it. And in terms of our colleagues, yeah, I mean, I've heard this argument as well. It's not uncommon in higher education. I have so much content to teach. I don't have time to teach academic integrity. Um, and so this is where having things like having it recognized in a teaching and learning dossier, uh, I think is valuable at an institutional level. And even beyond that, 
Now, when I had the opportunity to meet with the Campus Alberta Quality Council, one of the recommendations I made for them is that they actually uh, include it uh, in some of their guiding documents so that it can be included in program and curriculum review. So if one of the questions that's asked at the program level is what are you doing at program level as part of program and curriculum review to uphold integrity in your academic pro programs, then that becomes a marker of internal quality assurance. And once that happens, then that shifts the conversation. So there needs to be accountability, not only at the individual instructor level, but also at the institutional and teaching and learning level. And I know, for example, in the um, engineering school, when our engineering school was just going through its reaccreditation, that was one of the questions that the um, engineering accrediting body had was how are they upholding ethics and integrity in their courses? So they were kind of scrambling to show it and they were able to do it through curriculum mapping. So I think that's a pathway forward. But for individual ed educators who are resistant to that, there might be nothing to move them uh, until there's something above them uh, and beyond them to move them. Thank you. Uh, Tamara, you have the last question. Uh, thank you. A uh, comment and a question. A uh, comment. Thank you so much, Sarah. I, this is near and dear to many of our hearts. We all want to be doing the right thing and promoting for the right thing and evolving as times evolve. But it's a difficult world to be maneuvering in, especially with online delivery, et cetera, and, and all of the, the growth of contract cheating, et cetera. I'm wondering if you might comment on how um, on, on your perspective and, and anything that has been done in your university or that you might recommend to deal with the issue of faculty members, particularly those with precarious and precarious employment, inherently being penalized for reporting suspected misconduct and the time and effort involved that goes along with each of those cases and putting cases together, even though it is a responsibility, it's perhaps easy for some to, or easier or, or more amenable for some to sort of turn the other cheek. And also the ultimate impact on teaching evaluations, again, especially for those with precarious employment. So I'm, I'm curious if you might have a perspective on that or anything that you would recommend or that your school has done to address that issue. Um, well, in terms of recommending, I'm recommending that you carry on that exact conversation through either a panel discussion or something else on your own campus because it's a huge topic. Um, we've been we've been working on a project here to um, revise our teaching evaluations, and I was part of that working group for about a year and brought in you know there's lots of research to show the ways in which existing um, course evaluations are flawed, right? We know that there's gender bias in them. Um, and there is some evidence to show that students can engage in retribution um, if there's a reporting of misconduct, and then they still have access to their course evaluations afterwards that, uh, that they might take it out on the instructor, uh, or they might take it out on ratemyprofessor.com and give instructors low scores. Um, and so offering uh, instructors, if there's been a, a breach of integrity in their course, particularly if that involves groups of students or the cheating rings that we've been finding more and more during COVID, that an instructor has a chance to respond. Um, to the to things that come through in their teaching evaluations. Um, and so that the teaching evaluations can become uh, a sort of a dialogue uh, rather than used against individuals um, being just as penalizing as other forms of summative assessments for, for students. So that's one, one way for sure. And for those with precarious employment, I agree, it, it can be risky. Um, and these are things that need to be talked about at the institutional level. So now, for example, when it's in our uh, faculty handbook that it gets documented as a teaching and service activity. This is one way to help support those with precarious um, precarious employment. Um, but I agree that there are certain groups uh, that can be more at risk for their own uh, livelihood around this. And this is where those of us with permanent employment can help to advocate for those with precarious employment. But these are big, big questions and they deserve attention. So maybe I'll just end there knowing that we have some limited time, but yeah, please carry on that conversation. It's important. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we will. I do want to be respectful of people's time. I know many people will have uh, another Zoom meeting probably to get to at, at two o'clock. Uh, just a few closing remarks. I do want to mention that Academic Integrity Week is this week. It's taking place until the 22nd. Jackie Stewart has put a link in the chat where you 
can you can contribute to continuing the conversation uh, through discussion questions on the Academic Integrity website. Um, there will be an online feedback survey, I think, appearing in the chat very shortly uh, about this event. So please do take a moment to uh, click on that before you leave. There's some resources there that have just appeared for uh, Sarah Eaton's resources that she referred to. Uh, but most of all, I do really want to express thanks to, to Sarah. A fabulous presentation. You have given us lots to think about. Uh, I think we are on a journey towards developing a stronger institutional culture of, uh, of academic integrity. Uh, and this has been a really fabulous event along the way. So thank you for sharing your work, your insights with us today. And uh, yeah, terrific to have you. Thanks very much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, wish you a pleasant, uh, sunny Tuesday afternoon. Thanks again.